Do you not believe in the historicity of Jesus Christ? So a letter came this week. The gentleman is here tonight. I'm glad he is because it would take too long a letter to answer his, his letter. But he said, I was there last Friday. And during the question period, a lady asked the question concerning the historical Jesus. And from your answer, I gather that you said no. You do not accept the historical Jesus. I would go along with that. But do you not believe in the historical aspect in this book, say, of, well, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, or even, say, Neville? Relative to your true omnipresent being. And tonight I'll try to show you what I mean, based upon my own experience concerning the story of Jesus Christ. As far as I am concerned, it's the only reality. The only reality. And what you and I call the reality here to me are shadows. All these are shadows. I'll give you the story of a very able poet, painter, mystic, essay. We know him best as A.E., the initials A.E. He was George Butler, the Irish one. And in his work called The Tangle of Vision, he tells this experience. He said, where it happened, I will not tell you. But I will tell you what I experienced. I entered an enormous hall, vaster than any cathedral. And these columns were made of living, trembling opal. All opalescent, and they were trembling and living. Between the columns, the throne. And on each throne sat a fire-crested king. They differed. What I saw, his crown was made of fiery flowers. Another the dragon, and he painted the word picture of the different one. On the floor was this figure, a dark figure, and two kings passed their hands over the dark figure. As they passed their hands over it, their hands became fire, and fire came from their hands over this figure. And out of that dark figure rose a body as tall, as huge, as majestic, as glorious as any of the others seated on their throne. And when he rose, he became aware of the hall and his skin and raised his hand in greeting to them. And they in turn raised theirs in greeting to him. He had returned from his long journey through darkness into the hall once more from which he departed. And all together moved towards the end of the hall like a burst of light, like the sun itself, and all vanished into the sun, beams of light. I tell you, you did not begin in your mother's womb. You came down from heaven to experience death, to experience what you could not experience in any other way. You have a free nation existence. You are, and always has been, a son of God. The word God in Hebrew is a compound unity. The word is Elohim. The Bible begins with the word, in the beginning, God. And that word is Elohim. It's a plural word. A compound unity. One made up of others. We are the fragmented God in this world. Now the call has gone out. Bring my sons from afar. And my daughters from the ends of the earth. 
and we are called and being called one by one and we are awakened out of these dark garments and we are the king the son of God we were prior to the dream that we are having here so do I not believe in Jesus Christ well tonight I'll show you who he is I think I can God himself came and come into human history in the person of Jesus Christ. But whenever he comes, he is invisible to mortal eye. Completely invisible. He is the hidden Christ who will manifest himself only to a few. And he states the reason for it. So we are told in the 14th chapter of John, when he said, I will manifest myself to you. Judas, not Iscariot, the one that is called Thaddeus. But here it is Judas, the same word meaning praise. And he said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And then he answered, those who love me are loved by my Father, and they keep my word. They receive the word, for the word is not mine, but the word of him who sent me. What word? A discussion between men? No. The word is simply fulfilling scripture. We are sent to fulfill scripture. As a man fulfills scripture, he tells it. Not everyone will receive it. The majority will deny it. And they will say the man's insane. Those who believe in the historicity of Jesus Christ as a man, born in some unnatural manner 2,000 years ago, will not accept the true story of Jesus Christ. They will not accept the fact that Christ is now buried in every child born of woman. It is the only God daughter where he is buried. The little form that he wears is the only cross that he ever wore. This is the cross that he wears. He is buried in the human skull. And from the human skull he rises. And when he rises from that skull, everything said of him in scripture, that individual in whom he rose, experiences. Now he tells it. Very few will receive it. Very few. He will make himself manifest to those who receive it. And they will see him, and there will be no uncertainty as to what they see. They will know him to be Jesus Christ. So do I believe in him? Certainly. Is he individualized? Certainly. You will know him to be Jesus Christ, and yet your identity has not changed. You are completely individualized. We are the sons of God. And no two were crested in the same manner. That's what E.A. saw. That's what I see. I do not see one being where it is all gathered together and all have lost their identity. No. Yet each is Jesus Christ. The same being. And yet playing a different part in the body of God. All one body one spirit, one Lord, one God, and Father of all. So, if I believe in the historicity, I certainly do in this sense, but only in this sense, that taking place now in the world, he is being awakened in men, awakened in women. And as he rises in them, he is the same Jesus Christ spoken of in Scripture. And while he walks the earth, he will have witnesses to that. They will see him and know him to be Jesus Christ. And when he departs this world, which will be for the last time, he will appear then to many. He will appear first to the one called Peter, who is not a man. Peter is a state of consciousness. Then he appears to the disciples. They are not men. They are states of consciousness. Then he appears to all over 500 at once. Then he appears to James, 
Then he appears to the apostles. Then he appears, last of all, to Paul. These are all states of consciousness. They all must bear witness of who he is. He knows who he is. Because he has had the experience of A, he talks about. When he rose from his body. And his brothers, who preceded him in the rising, greeted him. And he raises his hands in greeting to his brother. He hadn't seen them since the journey began. And now the darkness is over, and he's returned to the light. And they all meet him. And then together, we all move into the light. At the end of the great place where first he was placed. He was there dreaming the entire dream of life. So it took 6,000 years. So what is 6,000 years? He was told in the beginning it would take him 6,000 years. But what would be 6,000 years when a 1,000 years is as a day in the eyes of God? It'll take you six days, and the world will call it 6,000. And the horrors and things that you will do, and everything man has ever done, you will do. Let no one tell you that you're so holy and so good you're going to avoid the doing. Everything that man has ever done is discussed openly in the Bible. We take the most glorious character of the Old Testament, David. Read him carefully. You'll find him in the book of Samuel, two books, the book of Kings, two books, the book of Chronicles, two books. Read it. If you don't think he's a rascal, then I do not know what a rascal is. And yet here is God's chosen one. Here was an extortionist. He goes to Nabal, the rich one. And he tells Nabal to give him money, a large sum of money, for protection. Well, that happens today. Protection money, what protection? It came at the time of the sharing of the sheep. And here is Nabal, this fabulously wealthy person, and now is the time to share the sheep. And he sends his messengers, David does, asking for extortion money to protect him. Like someone coming to you selling your little vegetables on the side. And you want protection money. And you're, you say, well, my people are nice people. They come and they're paying cash. If he doesn't have cash tonight, I give him credit because tomorrow he'll pass by, he'll pay me. And you say, no, you need protection. I don't need protection. And then within the week, you will know you need protection. He throws kerosene oil all over your vegetables. Protection from whom? From the rascal. And he was the extortionist. Everything he sent Uriah into battle. Knowing he would be killed, then he could get Bathsheba. Then after he simply foiled, not Uriah, but Nabal, Nabal dropped dead from fright. And then he took Nabal's wife. Before he took Nabal's wife, he took Nabal's money. He married Abigail, did he not? So you take the character, and yet he only personifies humanity. Everything that man could ever conceive of doing, David did. Now you take all the generations of men, and all of their experiences, and actually congest it into a single being, and project it. And that being is David. He is the Son of God. For who is playing all the parts? God. For God is made up of his sons. And all the sons together, all the generations of men, and all of their experiences fused into a single being and personified comes out of David. And David stands before you and calls you Father. Then you know who you are. No one has ever seen God. But his only son, who is dearest and nearest to his heart, he has made him known. Well, who is his son? Who is the one dearest to his heart? Are we not told in the book of Acts? I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. And here is David. A man after my own heart who will do all my will. And he is the son of God. So when David stands and calls you father, you know who you are. You are God. So the purpose of the whole thing is for God to give himself to his son. And raise his sons 
to the level of the Father. That's the purpose of the whole vast scheme. So God actually has a purpose. And he will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his mind. In the latter days you will know it clearly. And that purpose is to give himself to you. As though there was no one else in the world. Just you. And you are God the Father. If God is a father, then there is a child somewhere. And that child is David. So you have played or are playing or you're going to play all the parts in the world. So in the end you will say, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. So as far as this little garment, this is the garment in which I was buried, from which I rose, from which in the not distant future I will take off for the last time and move with my resurrected brothers into the fullness of light. This is the dark garment that all was wear. Whether the pigment be this color, black, yellow, pink, white, this is the dark garment. And in it we are dreaming. And we are buried in our skull. And in our skull we remain until one day we are called from the grave. And then who awakes? You awake. But how do you know who you are? Wait. Won't take long. You awake. And in a matter of three and a half years, you completely play within yourself the entire drama of Jesus Christ. And so you will know who Jesus Christ really is. No man looking at you can see Jesus Christ. You have to reveal yourself, make yourself manifest to the one that you would unveil yourself to. And he sees you in spirit. He does not see you with the mortal eye. So when you are seen, a little innocent child of eight saw me. A lady who is now gone from this world, Martha, she saw me. There are two here tonight who saw me. One only recently saw me in the role of the part called Jesus Christ. I tell you, I have awakened from the dream. I know who I am. Yet this little garment still holds me and will hold me until I take it off in the not distant future. And I promise you, I will make myself manifest to you. And you will know it. For no one comes unto me save my father calls him. But no one. And if he calls him, he calls him for a purpose. And in that day, I'll make myself known. But while here, only to a few. Well, so far I know of six to whom I've shown myself. The little one of eight, the innocent little one, and others grow in this world. And strangely enough, they're all women, as told us in Scripture, minus the one whose part was played by the male. But that is a state of consciousness, and not necessarily a male. For Peter is simply a state of consciousness. And that was played by the little one, the innocent one, who was then only eight, when she saw me in the row, and saw me as the king, as a sovereign, as the king, as you're told in scripture. And I will wear the crown of righteousness, the crown of faith, I've kept the faith. For all this was foreshown me before I set sail. Not could I foresee, but I learned how the wind would sound, after these things should be. I could not tell anyone while the journey was still in progress until the end. Then I learned how that spirit sounded. It's a wind, an unearthly wind. And then all of a sudden the whole thing unfolds within you and you are the one spoken of in scripture as Jesus Christ. For so Jesus Christ is always invisible. He is the Christus absconditus, always a hidden Christ. And if you're going to see him coming from without, you're looking for the false one. You'll never see him coming from without by your mortal eyes. Today there are those great evangelists speaking to millions of people on TV, telling you the end of the world is coming and they're waiting for you to come on the outside. They're looking in the wrong direction. He always comes from within. He rises from within the man in whom he is buried. 
and he is buried in every child born of woman. That child couldn't breathe were it not that Christ is buried within him. Christ within him is his own wonderful human imagination. When he says, I am, that's Christ. That's God. But he's asleep and he's dreaming the dream of life. And man is playing all these parts. Yes, even the extortionist. And who is doing it? God. And who is doing the murdering? God. Listen to the words in the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy. I, even I, am he. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And none can deliver out of my hand. I raise my hand to heaven and cry, I live forever. That is the Lord God Jehovah speaking. He's speaking in you. So anyone who kills, it is I. Anyone who is made alive, I make him alive. Anyone who wounds, I wound. Anyone who heals, I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. There is only God in the world. There is only one creative power in the world. And that creative power is your own wonderful human imagination. There is no other power. There is no other God. So the historicity, I say God himself came and comes, and don't forget, and comes into human history in the person of Jesus Christ. But whenever he comes, whenever he awakens in a man, by man, I mean generic man, male or female. As he awakens in that individual, he is invisible to mortal eye. He is known to the one in whom he awakens as the one himself. It is he who tells his friends about it. But 99% will not believe him. Because they know his origin, his physical origin. And so they will say, isn't this man Joseph's son? Do we not know his parents? Do we not know his brothers and his sisters? What is he talking about? That he came down from heaven. How can he come down from heaven? And we know him. We know where he was born. We know everything about him. So to come back to the answer of my friend who wrote the letter. The historic, uh, historical Jesus was not a name called Jesus. The word Jesus means Jehovah. The same thing Jehovah saved or the Lord saved. It could be John Brown. In whom he awakes. John Brown is known. The origin of John Brown is known. But he knows that John Brown knows he isn't John Brown. He knows who he is. When you awake and your brothers meet you, are you going to identify yourself with that little garment on the floor out of which you came? If today you went through your door and suddenly suffered from amnesia and completely forgot who you are, your wife, your children, everything about you. No matter what the world does, it can't bring you back to the memory of having a wife and having children. They can bring them before you and you can't recognize them. They show you your books, your own books, and you can't recognize them. Take you to the bank, you don't recognize it. And you are starving. And you have no money. And they can't persuade you that you could sign a check. Not with the name John Brown that you have now assumed, you were when you went into this state, you were Mr. Smith. But you do not know Mr. Smith. You only know John Brown. And here, under the name of Smith, you have a million dollars in the bank. You won't believe it. And they can't do a thing to bring you back to that memory. So when that memory returned, were you ever John Brown? When the memory returns and you are the Lord Jesus Christ, were you ever Neville Goddard? When the memory returns and you are the father of David, and David's father is Jesse, were you ever anything than Jesse? You know what Jesse means? The word Jesse means Jehovah exists. It is any form of the verb to be. In other words, he who bears the name I am. That's the father of David. And God's name forever and forever is I am. 
And the word Jesse simply means, by actual definition, Jehovah exists. And so when he stands before me, and memory returns, and here I'm looking right into my son's face, and he's David. And my memory returns now that I am the Lord God Jehovah. And I believe that I was a little man who found it difficult to pay rent and to buy food and to do the normal things in Caesar's world. And I, the father of David, and the father of David is Jehovah, the self-existing one, the eternal one, who owns all, the cattle and a thousand heels are mine. And were I hungry, I wouldn't tell you, I would slay and eat, for they all are mine. And yet, there were moments when I didn't know where the next penny was coming from, because I suffer from amnesia. That's why I went into that little garment, to pass through the world of darkness. And then comes that moment in time when you are called from the grave. And you awaken in the grave and come out of the grave and you are the same tall, glorious, majestic being that you were before. You went down and contracted yourself into that little body. For these beings that you see me, I tell you, they are giants. They are majestic in every sense of the word. The Egyptians built these things to their gods. Huge, big Images of God. They are dwarfs compared to those who wait for you. When you come out. And how could you come out of a thing that small. And be so majestic. And be so fire crested. And be so luminous. Self luminous. With life in yourself. And they're all waiting for you. And when you open your eyes. You recognize not only the place. But you recognize your kin. And raise your hands in salutation. And they raise their hands. And all together you move quickly, rapidly, into the waiting sun. For oh, that's you. This is who you are. That's your future. Every one of you will awaken. So the call has gone out. Bring my sons from afar. And my daughters from the ends of the earth. Read it in the 43rd chapter. Of the book of Isaiah. Go and call them. The call has gone out and everyone must come. Not one can be lost. So when I awaken. This that is called the historical thing. That I wear. I will take it off as a thing in which I lost my memory. And if in wearing this I forgot the being that I am. When I remember who I am. Must I still carry the memory of the thing that caused me to lose the memory of the being that I really am? So what historical being? This whole thing will vanish. This whole vast world will vanish like a dream. For it is a dream. You are dreaming this dream of life. For a purpose. You came into the limit of contraction called man. And then you will reach the end of the journey. As you are told, it will be a horrible journey. Read it in the book of Genesis. You will go into a land that is not yours. And in that land you will be enslaved. You will be hurt for 400 years. It doesn't mean 400 years as you and I measure time. 400 is the numerical value of the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The letter is Toph. It has a symbol. The symbol of the fourth, the last letter, whose numerical value is 400, the symbol is a cross. This is the cross. And I will wear it for 400 years in the sense as long as I wear this, I am still within the journey. In the end, when I take it off for the last time, I return to the being I was before I started the journey. Am I not told in the 82nd Psalm? And God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And now he speaks the same word 
The word translated God, singular, is Elohim. The word translated God in the plural is Elohim. So God, Elohim, has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, that's Elohim. And now he passes judgment. I say ye are God, sons of the Most High, all of them. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall as one man, O ye princes. And when you rise, you rise as the king. You're going through the entire journey as a horrible journey. But when you come out, the purpose of it all is to awaken as the one who is God the Father. So all of us reach the limit of contraction. That little thing sleeping on the floor. Even though it seems to be animated and walks around the street. It is sound asleep in that wonderful place. May I tell you? You are dreaming you're walking in America and fly into Europe and fly into the Indies and flying all over the world. You are dreaming it. But you are stationary in that little contracted body. And your brothers are eagerly waiting for your return. And you'll come back on time, may I tell you. Right on the button, you're coming back. And they will simply pass their hands above you. And sparks will fly from that hand, for it's life within themselves. And you'll begin to stir within. And you'll awaken. And you'll come out. And you'll be just as majestic as you were before, which is equal to anyone present. You are the king. And you arise from that state into what you really are. And they're all embrace you. And together, off you go quickly and vanish into the light. That's the being that you are. So I cannot tell anyone that I believe any more in anything other than in the being that we really are. And that being is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the reality of man. But he is not some little thing that you push off in space and say he came 2,000 years ago. That's not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is your own true identity. This is your false identity. You will awaken one day as Jesus Christ. Did not David call him my Lord? Is not David the son of God, as told us in the second psalm? And David said, I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. So then Christ asked the question, What think ye of the Christ? Whose son is he? And they answered, David. And he said, Why then did David in the spirit call him my Lord? Then he quotes the 110th Psalm. And the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. And if David thus calls him Lord, how can he be David's son? No, he's David's father. And David's father is nothing more than the sum total of all humanity. David himself is that one being which summarizes all of the experiences of man. And the father of it all is Jesus Christ, and you are Jesus Christ. You're God the Father. You wait. I'm telling you what I know. I'm not speculating. I'm not theorizing. Jesus Christ is God the Father. One day you will awake. And when you depart for the last time, at that moment of departure, you are Jehovah himself, who is Jesus Christ. And the sum total of all the experiences stands before you as the one who did all your will. And so you forgive it all. It was a plot, a plan to send man through the horrors of darkness to bring him out as God the Father. So the sons go through to come out expanding. There is no limit to expansion. There is only limit to contraction. And so that body that the mystic sea is lying there. That body is the limit of contraction. That which comes out is expanded by reason of its journey. 
And there is no limit to that expansion, to that translucency, only the limit to the opacity, to the contraction in which it placed itself. So to answer, and I'm glad he's here tonight because I really would know how to start a letter to answer his letter. It would take too long, but he is here, and so the letter is answered, and I don't have a secretary, may I tell you. And to dictate that to my wife would be too tedious and too long. So I'm glad you are here and you're answered to the best of my ability. So the historical Christ, right here. He is hidden behind everyone who is here. And so behind your face, you say, I am Bud. And you say, I am man. I'm Mary. You call it by a different name. But behind that mask, which causes you to forget who you are, is the being that you really are. And that being is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ and Jehovah are one. And they are the father. And the son is called David. And David is simply the sum total of all the experiences of humanity. Fused into a single being and personified. And that personification comes out as that infinite, beautiful, eternal youth that is called David. So you've played all. And you forgive all. Now let us go into the silence. Good. Now, are there any questions for you? There must be a question. Eve, any questions? It's not the easiest subject, but it's a very important subject. He's always invisible. Don't ever look for him to come from without. If you want to see him, believe the one that the Father has sent. Well, that's the answer that he gave to Judas. And Judas said, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Why not make one grand demonstration to the whole vast world and show them that you really are the being that you claim that you are? And he told them the limitations placed upon him. He who loves me will be loved by my father who sent me. And together we will come and abide and live with him who loves me. He who loves me will keep my word. And the word is, he'll believe that which I receive from my Father. And no one comes unto me unless the Father draws him. But no one. And so he who will actually accept the word that I give, he I will show myself to. For that being has awakened. And I return to the consciousness of mine that was before that the world was. And to him and only to him will I show it. And you say, but what about the little child? She doesn't come to the meeting. The mother doesn't discuss it with her at home. You do not know the intricate, intricate crossing of wires over the 6,000 years. If one only knew all the different passages that you and I have crossed as we crossed each other's paths, you would never ask it concerning little Melo. He's at the very end. Of the journey. Yes, ma'am. We should be what? Waiting for his coming. Well, we are told in scripture, set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Set it fully. Let all your hope be upon that. May it happen now. But you start it by believing in him whom he has sent. When they say, what must we do to be doing the work of God? He said, believe in him whom he has sent. I am telling you, if I get off this platform and start to discuss politics, you and I can discuss all, con all kinds of nonsense. That's not what he sent me to tell. I can be diverted. We're all human. But when I start telling you what I know from my own personal experience concerning Scripture, not what I have heard others say, what I have experienced, believe it. 
for I could not have had these experiences by taking thought. They simply happened. And I'm telling you the pattern just as it happened to me. When the wind one night possessed me, and the wind is spirit, and when I felt myself waking within my own skull, and to find myself sealed in a tomb, I knew my skull to be a tomb, and here I am, sealed, completely sealed. But I had the innate wisdom to push the base of my skull, which I knew that if I did, something would give. And from within, I pushed, and something gave. And through that little opening, I stuck my head, and then I squeezed my head out, as a child would squeeze through the womb of a woman. And I came out, just as a child comes out of a womb, inch by inch by inch. And when I was almost out, I then used my hands to pull the remaining portion of me out. And there for a moment I lay on the ground and looked back and saw this out of which I came. And it was ghastly pale, turning its head from side to side, just like someone in recovery from a birth or from some great ordeal. And then the wind persists. Now the wind is split. It seems to be coming from the distance and it seems to be still in my head. As I looked off towards the distance, something within me, a peculiar feeling is a wind. You hear it and you, it's like a storm, like a hurricane. I looked back where the body was. I hadn't been diverted more than, say, three, four seconds, not more than that. When I looked back at the body, it's gone. They removed the body just as you're told in Scripture. Where have they taken the body of my Lord? I cannot find the body. I am invisible to those who are not seen. For where the body was, three men are seated. And they were my three brothers. As told us by tradition. That the kings were three brothers. The shepherds were three brothers. And they are too concerned about the wind. And one went in search of the cause of it, thinking it was over the corner. And as he started towards the corner, he was arrested by something on the floor. As he looked down, he announced, why, it is Neville's baby. And raising this little infant in his hand, the other two said, how can Neville have a baby? With the most disgusting, incredulous voice. He didn't argue the point, he presented the evidence. And placed the evidence on the bed. And I took the little infant in my hand. They couldn't see me because I'm spirit. God is born. God returned. From the long journey. Or you must be born from above. So I took the little infant in my hand. And I said, how is my sweetheart? And with that, it broke into the most heavenly smile. As you're told, his name is Isaac. Which means he smiles. It's what the word means. I promise you a child. This is the sign that God has kept. And then the whole thing dissolves. The child is not something that I gave birth to. The child is a sign throughout all eternity that God is born. So he said to the, to the three, go quickly into Jerusalem, into the city of David, and there you will see the sign. And the sign is an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. And what is the significance of the sign? That this day a Savior was born in Bethlehem. A Savior, where the only Savior in Scripture is Jehovah. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And besides me, there is no Savior. If a Savior is born, it is Jehovah himself. He is raising us all from this level to his level, which is God the Father. Well, now, if he is God the Father, well, then show me the Son now. That was only the infant told in the ninth chapter of Isaiah. Unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. Now, where is the son? It's not the child. To us a child is born. That is the sign of the birth of God. But now a son is given. And God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Oh, where is the son? Well, then five months later, the son comes. And it's David. And David, you look right into the David's face, and you know he is your son, and he knows you are his father. Fulfilling scripture. I have found David, and he's cried unto me, Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. 
So I've come only to fulfill Scripture. So when I start to tell you what I know from my own experiences, believe me, if you would see me unveil myself to you when I take this form or for the last time. I have no control over your acceptance of what I tell you. You can either accept it or reject it. If you would see the truth of what I'm talking about, accept it. Well, if you accept it, I will unveil myself to you when I take this off. There are few I will unveil it to while I am still here. So far, I have picked out six to whom I have unveiled myself. There will be others.